happy to give you a warm welcome this morning. We're going to worship the Lord together as we sing uh, our opening hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, and the Lamb upon His Throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but His own. We want to exalt the Lord this morning as we worship, so let us stand as we sing together, please. Can we bow, please, for a few moments and just still our hearts before the Lord this morning? Our gracious, loving Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come this morning and crown thee with the praises of our lips. Exalt thee, dear Father. For the love and devotion of our hearts, we can, Father, bow in your presence, dear Father, with joy, 
Lord, that, that we today have the opportunity of meeting together and to worship the King of glory. Lord, we thank you for your love. Oh, the love of God is greater far than pen or tongue can ever tell. And Lord, we thank you, dear Father, this morning, even the youngest child uh, this morning in the house of God can know the love of God, uh, that know that there is one who loved us and gave himself for us. We love you today, dear Father. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the one who was willing to die that we might live. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity of again coming together as the people of God. Now, Father, we ask, Lord, that we might be more conscious of your presence amongst us than anything else around about. We ask, Lord, that you'll close us in with thyself. We thank you, Lord, that you've promised in your word that where two or three are met together, there am I in the midst. And we know that God in the midst of thee is mighty. And so, loving Father, we pray that you'll come. We want to be exposed, dear Father, to, uh, Lord, the word of God and to the truth of thy word. We pray, loving Father, that our hearts and minds might be opened. My Father, that you will minister to us, that we might be as a a vessel filled, eh, Lord, to overflowing. The psalmist could say, my cup overflows. And Lord, we thank you that there is blessing pressed down, shaken together and running over. And Lord, we pray for every family represented this morning, everyone who is gathered in your house. We pray, dear Father, that you will bless us this morning, that we might sense and feel and know, my Father, the riches of your grace, that, Lord, that you'll minister to us, and, Father, that you will bless. Lord, we seek your face. We ask for your blessing. We pray that you'll come, and, oh, Father, that you'll minister to us this morning. We do want to remember again those who cannot be with us my Father, we do pray for those who were laid aside and those, dear Father, who today, dear Father, cannot be in the house of God. And we ask, Lord, that you'll be with them in a very special way. We pray for Rose. We thank you, my Father, for the help in the week that has passed. And, Lord, as she enters a second week of treatment, we ask, Lord, that you will go before her that she might be very conscious of your hand upon her life, that she might know your presence with her in a very real way. We thank you for your hand upon Trevor, and we ask, Lord, that you will perfect that which concerneth him. For others, Lord, even here this morning, my Father, who need your touch, we thank you, Lord, that we can call, and you said, I will answer thee. We thank you, Lord, for those that are with us this morning, and we ask, Lord, that you'll particularly bless them. And, Father, minister to them. And, Father, we do pray that you'll remember for those who are ministering in other places. And we thank you, Lord, for what you are doing. And, Father, for the work of God and for all that we've been hearing of your grace and your goodness. We thank you for your work amongst, uh, Father, the, those who distribute the Hebrew Scriptures. And we ask, Lord, that you'll bless Tom and the ministry that you've given to him. We thank you, Lord, for Linda with us on uh, Father Wednesday, and Lord, for uh, what you're doing there, uh, even in Ukraine. And we ask, Lord, that you'll bless. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the work there in uh, Father Northcoats. And Father, we thank you for uh, the ladies' uh, morning, and Father, for the blessing there. And Lord, we, we give you praise for all that has passed. And, Father, for the, the, the encouragement that we've received. And, Lord, we ask, dear Father, that you'll continue to bless. We pray for Derek. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you'll, uh, Father, continue to strengthen him, help him, undertake for him. Uh, we pray, dear Father, that you'll grant uh, wisdom and help, uh, Lord, in the work that you've called him to. We thank you for James amongst us this morning. We pray that you'll bless. And, Father, we thank, Lord, of uh, all of the meetings of the convention mentioned in the uh, Father days that lie before, we pray that you will graciously undertake and bless. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the, the, the measure, dear Father, in which, uh, Lord, we can again meet together and, uh, Lord, conventions can take place. And we ask, Lord, that wherever there are those who have special efforts, we ask, Lord, that you'll help and that you will bless. Again, we remember uh, the people of uh, 
Ukraine, and we ask, Lord, and uh, Father, in a, a way, Lord, that, that can only be attributed to God, that you'll reveal yourself. Lord, we pray, dear Father, for those who have come through horrendous situations. We pray for children who have witnessed things that no child should ever have to witness. And Lord, we ask that you'll really come to them. And Father, minister to their minds and their hearts and their, uh, Father, uh, their bodies, we pray. We think, Lord, of the Christians, Lord, and we pray, dear Father, that you'll come to them. We ask, Lord, that you'll uh, just undertake. We, we know, dear Father, the danger of, uh, Lord, uh, all around. And we know that there's a spiritual battle also that they face. And we ask, Lord, that you'll help them, keep them. Uh, Father, uh, Lord, uh, their, their hearts, dear Father, will be stayed upon upon thee. And Lord, that you'll help them. For those who cannot worship together without fear, we pray that you'll come to them. For those who are suffering, O oh God, we ask that you'll bless. And Father, we pray that you'll continue to help. Uh, we ask, Lord, that, uh, Father, even the pastors and the churches and the countries around about, that they might really know uh, the blessing of God. We just lift our hearts to thee. We thank you, Lord, for Linda and Stephen and the family. Uh, Lord, we pray that these days will be days of refreshing, uh, days of blessing, days of rest. Dear Father, before their deputation, we ask, Lord, that they might really sense and know uh, the hand and the blessing of God upon them. We just lift our hearts to thee. We thank you, Lord, that we have freedom and liberty. But, O oh God, we pray that we will use every opportunity that you give to us. And so, love and Father, help and bless today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn again to uh, uh, next hymn, uh, Give Me a Sight, O Savior, of thy wondrous love to me. Uh, of the love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. And as we are uh, approaching this Easter time, we've been focusing upon uh, the suffering of the Lord and the triumph uh, as we will enter into Easter. Uh, but we want to focus afresh upon the wonderful love and what it cost the Savior this morning uh, to take our place and to bear our punishment. We stand, if we can, uh, to sing uh, this morning. Thank you.
Well, we do want to give you a very warm welcome this morning in the Saviour's precious name for uh, those in the sanctuary, the back room or the creche, wherever you are. Uh, we're very glad uh, that you're here, whether we can see you or not. Unfortunately, there's no live stream this morning. We've had technical problems a couple of mornings, but hopefully it'll be up later on. Uh, so apologize to those who are trying to connect this morning and not able to. Um, very glad to have the Park family this morning. Delighted. I've come further than most uh, this morning. We uh, trust that the Lord will bless. Also nice to have James uh, and Julianne this morning. And lovely to have Kathy this morning also. Uh, we're delighted that you've been able to come uh, today. I do want to remind you just of a few announcements. Uh, immediately after the service uh, of around the Word of God, we'll be remembering the Lord's Supper. Uh, so do please remember that. If you know and love the Lord, we encourage you to wait with us uh, for a little while as we just remember uh, what it cost the one who gave us everything that we have. Uh, so do please remember that. Then tonight, we're delighted that Carol will be sharing her testimony. Uh, do please remember that if you can encourage others to come along. That's for our evening service tonight at 6.30. Uh, there will be a prayer meeting at 6 o'clock before that. Uh, so do please remember that. Tomorrow night, uh, for the board members, there's a seminar uh, to encourage and guide effective church board leadership. And uh, Pastor Victor Maxwell will be the lecturer for that. And do please remember that, board members. And that's tomorrow night in Dungannon, 7.30. The Bible study on Tuesday at uh, 8 p.m. And then on Wednesday, a prayer meeting here in the church uh, from 8 to 9 uh, so do please and I encourage you to come, uh, if you can, to the place of prayer. Then next Sunday, in the will of the Lord, there will be Sunday school, 1015, uh, sun, uh, teen search at 1030. More uh, will be a time of prayer in the church sanctuary, also at 1030, and the morning service uh, next Sunday as we celebrate and give thanks to God for uh, the glorious resurrection. What a beautiful morning to be uh, able to come to the house of God. So do please remember next Sunday morning, 11.30, and then the evening service uh, at 6.30. Uh, just also mention the Faith Mission Convention uh, starts on Friday the 15th, running through to Tuesday. And there are leaflets on the table outside, and you can take with all of the details. Uh, there are different churches that they're using this year, and the format is slightly different from other years. Thankfully, they've been able to have the convention, God willing, this year. So do please, if you can get along to any of the meetings, uh, do please remember uh, the Faith Mission uh, Convention. I think that's all by way of announcement. Uh, we're going to sing together again uh, before we turn to the Word of God. Uh, Beneath the cross of Jesus, I would fain would take my stand, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. We'll stand again as we sing together, please.
like to turn to several short passages of Scripture uh, this morning. Uh, First of all, from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 27. Matthew's Gospel, it had mentioned last Sunday that uh, over the Sundays of this month, uh, we want to focus upon the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of the Lord Jesus. And we want to read just a few verses from, uh, first of all, Matthew and chapter 27 and verse 57. Verse 57. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. Then Joseph had taken the body. He wrapped it in a clean white linen cloth. And they laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone uh, to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there were Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. In Mark's Gospel and chapter 15, Mark's Gospel in chapter 15, and reading from verse 42 is again, uh, and now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly to Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And he called unto him the centurion and asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it, Uh, of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph, and he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone upon the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. And then the account from Luke's Gospel in chapter 23. Luke's Gospel in chapter 23 and from verse 50 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deeds of them. And he was of Arimathea, the city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. And this man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus and took it down and wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. And the day of the preparation of the Sabbath drew drew on, and the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after, and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid. And they returned and departed, and and returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment 
And then the final account from John's Gospel, and chapter 19 and verse 38. Verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. And he come, came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths uh, with the spice as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now the place where he was crucified was uh, a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. They they laid they, Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the uh, sepulcher was nigh at hand. And we'll end there. We know the Lord will bless uh, the reading of his word. Can we bow, please, for a few moments? Our loving Father, again we bow before you. We have come to worship, and Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that we might know the help of the Spirit of God. We pray, dear Father, that you will just open our eyes afresh. Lord, we pray that we might see uh, Jesus. Lord, that you will reveal yourself to us in your word. And Lord, we pray that our hearts will be strangely warmed, that you will bless the challenge and Father, we pray that you will just help us. Lord, I need your help, and I ask in Jesus' name that you'll graciously help me, for I ask it for your glory. Amen. 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 As we have been looking over last Sunday and again today, we see so many of the prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ being fulfilled Whenever the Passover was instituted, God gave to Moses directions that the lamb was to be a perfect lamb. And one of the things that was necessary was that the lamb was not to have a leg broken. And so the prophecy was given concerning the Messiah. We read in Psalm 20. Or 34, uh, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. And you know that as we looked last week, how uh, whenever they came, because it was the Sabbath, and they came to the first and they broke the legs, they would have taken a, uh, maybe a metal object or, or something and they would have shattered the legs. Uh, the way that they sort of lived so long uh, in crucifixion was that they would have uh, been suspended with their hands hanging, and that would have meant that they, they, they couldn't breathe, so they would have put the weight of their body on their legs to raise themselves up so that their lungs would expand. And so that they endured for sometimes days the agony of crucifixion, but to speed up the process because it was a high day, and they would have broken the legs shattered the legs so that uh, they could not and they would suff uh, suffocate there as they hung upon the cross. And yet the Scripture said that not a, a bone of him would be broken. Uh, we know that uh, before they were to offer a lamb, they would have to inspect the lamb to see was there any flaw. Uh, they, could, they had to uh, offer a perfect lamb. And we know as we looked last week at how Jesus was examined and uh, time and time again. Uh, Pilate, who examined him, uh, uh, said, I find no fault in him. Uh, you find that in Luke's gospel in John uh, as, uh, on two occasions. And again, uh, at the end, verse uh, 19, chapter 19, verse 6, I find no fault in him. 
having examined him. Now, we know that uh, they mocked the Lord Jesus as it was prophesied in uh, Psalm 22. And all oh, they see me, laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake this, the head. And then they, uh, the prophecy, the very words that the Lord Jesus uh, was spoken he, uh, around the cross, he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, uh, seeing he delighteth in him. Uh, the prophecy again in Psalm uh, 69 and in verse 21, they gave me gall for my meat and my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And as Jesus was hanging upon the cross, as we noticed last week, he cried, I thirst. And they gave him vinegar to drink. Now, all of the details prophesied in the scripture. Uh, the, uh, Psalm 22, verse 16, For dogs have compassed me, assembly of the wicked uh, have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Uh, and we find in Zechariah, and chapter uh, 12, I am poured out uh, upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. And again, long before crucifixion was invented, uh, the fact that his hands and his feet would be pierced and that they would look upon him whom they have pierced. Uh, again, we find... Uh, uh, that, that whenever they pierced uh, the, the side of the Lord Jesus, the spear went up into his heart and flowed out water uh, and blood. And uh, they tell me that uh, those are the, uh, the symptoms of a broken heart. And again, we find prophesied in the scripture, Psalm 69, reproach hath broken my heart. He didn't die of suffocation, but he died of a broken heart, as the hymn writer has penned those words. And even to the fact that they cast lots for his vesture, uh, God fulfilled. Uh, all of these things were fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus. Psalm 22, uh, they parted my garments among them, and uh, my cast lots for my vesture. And so we find that in uh, the Scripture, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, every single detail was prophesied and was fulfilled in the minutest detail. But we recognize that as we uh, look at the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize also that uh, prophecy was fulfilled in his burial as well. And I want us to think about the burial uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it teaches us and what uh, we can learn uh, from it. We're told in uh, that beautiful prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 8, uh, he was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he is cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people uh, was he stricken. And I believe that, that even there, he was taken from prison uh, and from judgment. Uh, uh, the, uh, taken from prison and from judgment. Uh, the way that the Lord Jesus was treated was totally illegal as far as the Roman law was concerned and even uh, the, the practice that would have been common. Uh, whenever someone was taken before the court uh, or taken from prison to, ju to judgment, uh, uh, they would have been tried. And then after the trial, uh, even if they were pron uh, pronounced guilty, they gave two days. So they were sent back to prison, as it were, for two days. And the purpose of those two days was, uh, just in case, uh, new evidence came to light. And then and they discovered something that they didn't already know about the person who was being tried. And the other reason they say what was given was so that the person who was sentenced to death would have time to set their, uh, their house in order, as it were. And yet we find that he was taken from prison straight to judgment. There was no delay. Uh, they, they took him, uh, and uh, they, uh, the Bible tells us that he was cut off. He was taken uh, without uh, following the, 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 the normal procedure, he was taken straight from uh, the, the judgment to uh, face uh, the, the cruelty of his death. And the Bible talks about uh, he was cut off out of the land of the living. It talks about the violence of, of his death. He was cut off 
Uh, he was stricken the cruelty uh, of the death of the Lord Jesus. And then we have in verse uh, 9 of uh, chapter 53, uh, uh, verse 9, it says, And he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Uh, he, he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. And because he had done no violence, uh, we recognize that uh, not only the death of the Lord Jesus uh, was uh, prophesied, but the very fact of his burial would be prophesied. Uh, we know that whenever uh, Paul was writing in that great chapter uh, of chapter 15 of Corinthians, when he is speaking that great resurrection chapter, uh, uh, con confirming to us the vital importance of the resurrection, if Christ be not risen, then we are without hope. But as Paul was penning that great chapter, he says, For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received, how the Lord, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. In fulfillment of all that the Scripture had declared, he, was, he, was, he died according to the Scripture. But he goes on to say, And was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scripture. Again, the fulfillment of prophecy. And so we are introduced to uh, this man that we want to spend a few moments this morning uh, and just see the wonder of how God fulfills His Word uh, in, in the life and then even in the death of the Lord Jesus. We are introduced to uh, Joseph of Arimathea. And again, uh, uh, each one of the portions of Scripture that we have read together tells us maybe just a little more about this man. There's not an awful lot that we know about him uh, other than the fact that he was, he was a rich man. Uh, the, the Scripture tells us that in Matthew chapter 25, or cha sorry, chapter 27, uh, and there came a, a rich man uh, of Arimathea, and, and he was a disciple uh, uh, we, we know that. Uh, we, we find uh, just the details that are given to us here in this passage of Scripture. Uh, it tells us that, that he took the body of Jesus, he wrapped it, and he laid it in his own new tomb, uh, which was hewn out of the rock. And uh, so we find uh, that here is this man uh, of Arimathea, uh, some would say perhaps that that area of Arimathea was where Samuel was born. I'm not exactly sure where Arimathea was, but here is a man who is, in a sense, an outsider. He comes, and he's in Jerusalem. He is a very rich man, and he has his own new tomb in Jerusalem. Now, he had prepared for himself a tomb, but he didn't prepare that tomb in Arimathea, but he prepared a tomb in Jerusalem. His own new tomb. The Bible tells us in Mark's gospel that Joseph of Arimathea was an honorable counselor. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, the top uh, men who, who those 72 that, that, that gathered, uh, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, the scripture tells us that he was an honorable man. And he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was looking for the Messiah. Uh, he was a man who was, uh, who, uh, was honorable. Uh, so the scripture tells us, Luke's gospel tells us that he was a good man and a just. Uh, so uh, we recognize he had a testimony uh, to be uh, a, a good man. He was a, a man who was trusting uh, God uh, and then the Bible also tells us that he, while he was member of the Sanhedrin, he consented not to the council and to the deeds. So whenever the council were voting uh, to put Jesus to death, uh, he, he, uh, he wasn't consenting. He wasn't giving his, he wasn't in agreement with what they were doing. Uh, he, here is this one man, this powerful man, this rich man. Uh, right in the very center of Jerusalem, uh, with this key position, uh, he uh, wasn't consenting. And then the Bible tells us, uh, also in uh, John's Gospel, as we read, uh, that Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, uh, for fear of the Jews. So here is a man, and, and uh, while he is a good man, 
Uh, while he is a man who has who, who a position and he has wealth and he has power, he is a man who is bound by fear. Uh, he is a secret disciple because of the fear of the Jews. Now, uh, we know from the scripture that, that uh, the Jewish, uh, the Sanhedrin or the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if anybody uh, was, was willing to stand on the side of Christ, they would have been exterminated. There was a price to pay to, to be identified with the Lord Jesus. And here is this man, and he was a secret disciple. He, he knew, like Pilate, uh, he, he knew what was right. But rather than speaking out against what was right, he was a silent uh, voice in a sense. Uh, the Bible tells us that he was uh, this man. And, and then we're introduced to Nicodemus also. And now, whenever you think about the wonder of this, here are two men, two members of Sanhedrin, two men who have not yet been able to take a public stand. Uh, uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He was seeking uh, for the way of salvation and light, as the, as the chorus says. But uh, the Bible tells us that he was the one who came uh, and, and Nicodemus. Now, uh, to take a body down from the, uh, the cross... Uh, and, and to take that body to a tomb, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, I don't think, could have done it himself. But here is, here is Nicodemus standing with him. Uh, and uh, uh, you notice in um, John's gospel, it uh, tells us a, a number of things that I want to just uh, focus in upon. It tells us that, that in verse 39, and then came Nicodemus, also Nicodemus, uh, which was uh, first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Now, there's significance in that uh, that we look at maybe in a moment. But then it tells us, and they took the body of Jesus and they wound it in linen clothes uh, uh, with the spices after the manner of the Jews to bury him. And again, we find uh, that uh, he, here are these men uh, that being a secret disciple. And yet, at the death of the Lord Jesus, even though he knew and he did not give consent to the death of the Lord Jesus, something happened in his heart and in his life. And while he was afraid of the Jews, he found the courage and the faith uh, to, to, st to lay aside his fears and his timidity. And he went in boldly into Pilate. Here's a man and something happened in his life through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ that set him free from the fears. And he went in to Pilate and begged the body. He was identifying with, with, with Jesus. Uh, hatred for Christ. And, and, and the, the, the opposition towards Christ was at his height. And yet here is a man with, a, with, with this position, and yet he's willing to take a stand. He's willing to come and, and stand out boldly so that he might take the body of the Lord Jesus. And he uh, says, Nicodemus also came. And so we find uh, here uh, that uh, we have these facts that are given to us in the Scripture. And then we have the, the prophecy of Isaiah and he made his grave of the wicked and the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Now, whenever we understand the culture and uh, the way things were, were operated, uh, perhaps in, in, in times, crucifixion would have been very common. Uh, criminals would have been crucified. And even whenever Jesus was being crucified, he was, he was crucified between two thieves, uh, two criminals. And... Uh, uh, we, we find that whenever criminals died, uh, whenever someone was crucified, unless there were family members who went to take the body, the body was taken and it was thrown out onto the outside the city on a rubbish heap, a place that was, had the no, name Gehenna, which we get the, the picture of hell. Uh, and th that body would have been thrown out. There would have been all the garbage of the city, any dead animals or anything, and, and, and criminals would have been thrown out under this rubbish heap. And there they would have just been lay there, and, and uh, that, that smoldering fire would have consumed them. And that would have been the fate of any criminal. And yet the Scripture tells us that he made his uh, grave of the week and the rich in his death. 
and that uh, we find and that Jesus, uh, while he was crucified amongst two thieves, uh, cr- uh, crucified amongst the wicked, uh, it tells us that, that uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and now the amazing thing is that, that Jesus had brothers, half-brothers, and yet there was none of his half-brothers came to take the body of Jesus. There was none of the disciples came to take the body of the, of the Lord Jesus. But God so worked in the hearts of these men, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and uh, uh, Nicodemus. And then that little phrase, I want to go back to uh, where it says uh, that they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths uh, uh, with spices after the manner of the Jews to bury. Now, I understand uh, that the Jewish laws uh, were very particular in a lot of things, which included burial. You realize that, that Christianity and certainly the, the Jews were taught to, to have respect for the dead. There, there are cultures and, and, uh, where, where there's no Christian influence and they don't have any respect for the dead. And, and they don't bury their dead. They don't care for the dead. The dead are not important in a sense. And, but for Jewish culture and, and even in Christian uh, culture, uh, there is a sense in which the, there is respect that is shown uh, to the body. And so uh, the Jews, uh, before they would have buried, uh, the body would have been washed and an, any foreign matter would have been removed. That was the customs of the Jews. Now, I want you just to think about that for a moment. Here is this man, this rich man, this man that is, is in a sense, one of the the highest in all of of the the, the authorities of of the Jewish people, a man who was a part of the Sanhedrin, a man who who was uh, up until this time a secret disciple, and he goes and begs the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, I can only try to imagine what that was like. I don't know how high the cross would have been or how difficult it would have been to take the body of Jesus down from the cross to remove his hands from those, those uh, uh, stakes or the, the nails that were piercing his hand and his feet to, to, to allow that dead body that had been so defiled and so scarred and marred to, 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 to take that body down and the weight of that body on them, that, that they were identifying with the person of the Lord Jesus. And, and you think of it for a moment, uh, the, the care and the love and the attention that they gave to the body of the Lord Jesus. We know that, that uh, some of the other scripture tells us about those who walk on the road to a mess, and all of their hopes had been dashed they had believed that Jesus was the Christ, but they were, they were sad. Their, their hopes were dashed. And, and here is the body of the Lord Jesus. He's dead. And we find the tenderness and, and the care in which uh, Joseph of Arimathea, this wealthy man, takes that. It doesn't say that he sent one of his servants to do that. Joseph of Arimathea, he took the body of the Lord Jesus. And there's that body, if you can try to picture in your mind what what that would have been like. The splinters of wood from that old cross. We we sing that hymn, the old rugged cross. Remember someone going to the BBC uh, to do a a television program uh, at Easter time. And they they nailed two two pieces of wood together, rough pieces and, and they were bringing it in as a prop to the, uh, the studio to, to record. And the people in the BBC, they looked at it and they said, Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, that, that's too offensive. We've got a nice, shiny cross. And dear friend, there's nothing beautiful about the cross, but here is the Lord Jesus. He is placed on that rugged cross. And the splinters of wood that would have pierced his body, every single one of them would have had to have been taken out by Joseph of Arimathea. And to prepare the body of the Lord Jesus. That, that face that was covered in spittle had to be washed by Joseph and, and, and by Nicodemus. 
that brow where the, the, the thorns had pierced into his head and they had they'd smote him with the reeds. Maybe some of those thorns had embedded into his, into his brow and they would have had to remove those thorns until everyone was removed. The wounds were washed according to the preparation of the Jews for burying. We find uh, that Jesus uh, here and uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, as they watch uh, uh, and, and the, 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 lacer, the lacerations on his back, the Bible tells us his back was like a plowed field. His visage was so marred more than any man so that he was unrecognizable. And here is Joseph of Arimathea, and, and, and he's coming to take the body of the Lord Jesus. And they take him down from the cross. The one who, 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 the crowd, the multitude say, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And they cast the same in his teeth as they mocked him on the cross. And now Joseph, he has seen something in Christ. And, and he gives, he, he steps out to be identified with Christ. He, he goes Away beyond what, what, what is comfortable to identify with Christ. And he takes the body of Jesus and he washes it. That little phrase that we find recorded in John's gospel about Nicodemus. They brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And they tell me that that amount of aloes and, and myrrh were only used for a king. So they took the body of the Lord Jesus and, and they gave him a king's burial. They gave him the burial of a king. And the scripture tells us that, that uh, all of these things uh, would be uh, fulfilled according to the scriptures. Christ died our sins according to the scriptures. On the third day, he, uh, he rose again. And the scripture tells us that the Christ died according to the scriptures and was buried according to the scriptures. The rich in his death. Nicodemus, uh, they were prepared to identify uh, with the Lord Jesus. Shame on us sometimes. Whenever we're afraid to be identified with Jesus, we go into a restaurant and we're afraid to bow our heads and give thanks to, for a meal because we don't want to be identified. Here are men and they were willing to be identified. They found courage and faith to go to Pilate and beg the body, but they show this, this love and devotion and this care for, for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we find the challenge that I want to leave as has come to my own heart. We find the scripture reminds us that the church is the body of Christ. The challenge is, how do we treat the body? Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have done it unto these, the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. The, the, the scripture tells us, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples when you have love one toward another. And here are, here are two men that are examples of how, to, how they cared for the body of the Lord Jesus. And the challenge that comes to you and me. How do we care for one another? How do we treat one another? Is there love? Is there compassion? The reality is that the church, the body, is still a wounded body. And there are many who are hurting and many who have been wounded. And, and, and maybe perhaps like the scripture says of Jesus, he was wounded in the house of his friends. 
And so often, sometimes we're cold. Sometimes people say the church is a cold place. The Scripture does tell us that he that hath friends must show himself friendly. And maybe there are those who say that the church is a very unfriendly place. But maybe the reason is because that we're a very unfriendly people. But here we have in this passage of Scripture, it took a picture of, of Joseph. We, we, we see the transformation in the life of, of the Philippine jailer. He was cruel. He took Paul and Silas and he thrust them into the inner prison even though their backs were ripped to pieces. And whenever he, he locked them with their feet in, in, in the stocks, he went and he lay down and he fell asleep. But there was a change whenever grace came to his heart. And there was a change in his life. And, and he went in and he cried, what must I do to be saved? And it tells us that he took them out the same hour of the night and he washed their wounds. And dear friend, there's a challenge for us at this Easter time. We can be critical. We can be hard. We can be harsh. We can be indifferent. We can be careless. We can be self-centered. We can be a lot of things. But we ought to be a caring people. We ought to be a loving people. We ought to have a people who have a heart of compassion. And when we see the wounds before Thomas was touched by the grace of God and the truth of the resurrection, his heart was hard. He says, except I see in, the, in his hands the print of the nail and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Sometimes our hearts can be hard. And we need to see Calvary afresh. And we need to realize what a cost. Here is the Son of God. And he was willing to be wounded. He was willing to go down right into death. Where he lay as a, as a helpless body. But he was washed. And he was carried. And he was laid the place where one day he would rise again. And I trust that God will help us. That as we think at this Easter time, not only of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we think of the body. Remember that we are the body. We are the body of Christ. And whenever, whenever Peter was, was standing before the, the people on the day of Pentecost, he says, you by wicked hands have crucified and slain. They hadn't been the instruments, but they had been part. And dear friend, I trust that, that as God's people, as little fellowship here, that God will fill our hearts with the courage and the love and the compassion to care, to be a caring people. May God help us. May God bless his word. Trust that some of this will be an encouragement and a challenge to you. We're going to sing our after the service we're going to sing uh, we're going to have our communion service. We have been focusing on the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, but one of the things that we remember is not only the fact that Christ died, but he's going to come again. And we have a glorious hope. So we're going to sing about the, the, the coming again of Christ. The victory. Lo, he comes with clouds descending, once for favored sinners slain. Thousand, thousand saints ascending, swell the triumph of his. Hallelujah. We want to worship him this morning. He was willing to die and rise so that we can look out into the future and realize we're to remember until he comes. He is coming. And the only way we can be ready for that coming is by trusting in him. But if we're trusting in him, we ought to be rejoicing. So I trust that the Lord will help us. Um, we'll get on to the tune, I'm sure. It's a different tune that's in the book, uh, but uh, we'll see how we get on.
I think maybe some of us know the tune. Let's stand to sing. Our loving Father, we do thank you for the one who was willing to suffer. We thank you, dear Father, that not only was he buried, but he rose again. And Lord, as we anticipate, dear Father, uh, Easter Sunday morning, Father, you are able to rejoice. We thank you, dear Father, we can rejoice today. And for the one who has triumphed, one who sits upon a throne, and one who is coming again, and every eye shall see him, and they that pierced him. And Lord, we ask in Jesus' precious name that you will find, and Lord, hearts that are devoted to you. My Father, like Joseph and Nicodemus, my Father, willing to pay the price to be identified with the one who loved them and gave himself for them. So, Lord, help us. Help us as we, uh, Father, come to the table, as we remember, dear Father, not only the, the suffering and the death, but the fact that you are coming again. So, Lord, be with us. Make this a hallowed time, we pray, for those who can wait. And may your blessing upon each one, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do remember, if you can, wait for a little while as we remember the Lord's death. <laughs> 